crash test dummy, lessons from scaling, Coinbase Clubhouse, and uh, DoorDash. And that was mainly, you know, it's a title that ChatGPT gave me. And the focus was going to be on like, hey, yeah, I did a bunch of scaling stuff and um, had some fun. But as I got going on the talk, I realized that there, it had nothing to do with crash test dummies or crashing or anything like that. It really kind of had more of like, a, oh, man, wild, um, what was it called? Gonzo journalism. So I, I had uh, MidJourney make me that. I think it looks pretty cool. So Fear and Loathing in Silicon Valley is the current working title. Um, I really just want to talk about some of the things I experienced. Um, I did it all today. So I did this all today, pulled some slides from other talks. And uh, so you know, I apologize if it's a little bit uh, windy, but we'll get there, all right? Uh, and if anybody needs a break, we can take an intermission. Is that an option? Yeah. I, th I, think, I think it'll be fine, though. I think it'll be fine. Um, but. Uh, we'll just, just feel it out if you're bored doing intermission. Um, but I'd like to start with saying that you probably can't comprehend exponential growth. I'm not saying you're stupid, I'm just saying the human mind can't comprehend it. So exponential growth is basically doubling, right? And you know, just a quick pop quiz, how many weeks of 100% growth, which is exponential growth, would put a company or a service over 100x scale? Does anybody know this number? off the top of their head, if you have one and you double what? Seven. Seven. Seven weeks. Seven weeks is what you got. If you're growing at 100% week over week, you have seven weeks and you're 100x growth. So you have, if your company starts growing and they're going, uh, they're doubling every week, which happens all the time in, in like hockey stick growth companies, you have to make every piece of that system scale 100x in seven weeks. And yeah, there, there's the answer. Um, but that means, to put this in perspective, for those of you who run services or have any type of um, yeah, limited resource, um, a, 10 a, a resource that is at 10% utilization one week at exponential growth is overloaded completely at three and a half weeks. Um, this applies to really everything. It's not just servers and backend stuff. Like you can imagine a restaurant or you know, a river or whatever you want. Like all systems kind of react like this to exponential growth. They eventually overload. So this is something else that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is like a chessboard example showing exponential growth. I found this on Google Images. If you double the rice grains, every you know, thing on the board, by the time you get to the last square on the board, I actually forget the exact number, but it's more than the rice grains have ever been created in the history of humanity. Never been that many rice grains that could fit on that last square of that chessboard. Exponential growth is crazy. And lesson number one, exponential growth is fast, it's furious, and it's real. But enough with the hook. Let's get into it. A little bit about me. So I went to Temple for economics. I did the six-year program at Temple, which doesn't exist. I just like to drink. Uh, <laughs> I still like to drink, <laughs> but um, not that way. And I like to bike around town a lot. I have three young kids. This is a recent picture. They're all really stupid young, so thanks to my wife for letting me be here. Um, I got my first break at a company called S. Walter Packaging doing IT support when I was in college. And that kind of, I Game of Thrones my way up to being a systems administrator by the time I left, which I parlayed into working at Comcast for four months until I got a job at Urban Outfitters, which is where I worked for a while and kind of cut my teeth a lot. I also am really obsessed with my basement. It's another thing about me. I'm really, really obsessed with my basement. This is a before picture. I should have put an after in, but I just wanted you to imagine this dungeon that I slave in every day. That's what I've been doing recently on my uh, extended paternity leave. But enough about me. The best thing that ever happened to me was uh, buying drugs on the internet. So back when I was in college, and slightly following college, um, I went on Coinbase, this is like 2012, and I'd heard that you could buy drugs online. I thought that seemed pretty cool. I didn't believe it was real. And I thought, well, if this is real, obviously you're going to get in trouble. But I did. I bought a little bit of Bitcoin. At the time, I think Bitcoin was trading for like seven bucks or something like that. And I bought it. This, isn't, this is just from Wikipedia or The Observer or whatever. But this is what Silk Road looked like. I wasn't buying crazy stuff. I bought some weed lollipops. I had some fun. 
Um, this is obviously in the before days, before this is all legal. And I kind of, you know, tried it out, told a bunch of people it was interesting, but at the end of the day, the price of Bitcoin at that time in 2012 just skyrocketed up here to like 200 bucks. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I'm not dealing with this again. I'm not paying, I'm not paying $200 for Bitcoin. Of course, like over the next years in 2014, 2013, it got really crazy. The price of Bitcoin just went absolutely insane. Um, and, you know, everybody heard the news stories or whatever, but we kind of honestly all forgot about it. And I got back to my boring day jobs. I was working at the time at a company called Cloudmine in Philadelphia, um, which I'm sure nobody's heard of, but we were a venture funded company in Philadelphia, uh, which, where I lived at the time. And we really cared about security because we had patient data. So we didn't actually care about the patient data, but we had to pass a lot of certifications and HIPAA compliance stuff. But importantly, our stack was AWS, Rails, and MongoDB. So I kind of cut my teeth, worked at this company for three years, and uh, unfortunately, didn't do so good for CloudMine. This is after I left, but ended up going to bankruptcy. And for me, it ended up being a, a great learning experience. I was long gone by this point, but the writing was on the wall. Um, we had a lot of loans, and we weren't making any money. So that's how it happens. But as a result of this, um, it appeared like Coinbase, the company I bought the Bitcoin to buy drugs from, had done a search in their records. And they compared it to GitHub profiles with recent activity with Ruby. And they connected it to my profile and reached out to me. Um, they were looking for specifically infrastructure experience in a security field. So I got reached out to, and for those who don't know what Coinbase is, Coinbase, like I kind of have already said, is where you can go to buy or sell Bitcoin uh, or Ethereum, Litecoin. Uh, back in the day, those are the only three currencies they had. They actually used to have this, these little chocolate jar, jars at the front desk where you, you could, they were chocolate, aluminum coins that you could eat. Uh, and they call it the, the initial chocolate offering. If you've been in crypto at all, it's kind of funny. That was after they added Bitcoin Cash. We got another jar. And then they started adding more currencies and they got rid of the chocolate because who likes to have fun when you're a big company? But there were some important details here, right? I was really lucky that they're a company that really valued security. Um, you can't lose the Bitcoin. So you have hundreds, or billions of dollars of Bitcoin stored away. You can't let hackers in. And they had really extremely bursty traffic. Those are the big requirements that were kind of um, the company had. They were also on Rails, AWS, and MongoDB. So I was very lucky to have that experience. But this is what the architecture looked like at the time. Very, very straightforward and simple for the most part. Um, there was a load balancer with Cloudflare fronting it for you know, stop DDoSs, some Rails servers. Um, so for those who aren't really in the world of back end, a server basically um, on the back end, when I'm talking about app servers, really they're just serving requests when you open an app. They service the request. They do a bunch of stuff. So they authenticate you, make sure you're who you are. They check with databases. They check with different services and they kind of finalize and return the request to you. So almost everything that you touch on a mobile app is touching a back-end server. They're doing all the hard work. The app itself that you have on your phone really doesn't do anything except talk to those back-end servers. We had some crazy lockdown crypto servers that we would interface with on the back-end. Uh, there was MongoDB, uh, that was our main database. And this is where I worked, in awesome infra land. And all we did is we just made these fancy tools. We made fancy tools that did um, really anything you could think of. We were trying to deploy stuff faster than anywhere else, more secure than anywhere else. It was fun. And for the next, I guess, two years, this green line's when I joined. And for the next you know, year and a half, two years, all I did was just worry about these awesome infra tools. I didn't really care about anything else in the company. I didn't really care about Bitcoin. I didn't care about any of that. I just did awesome, fun infra stuff that seemed cool to me. Uh, but then something happened. Um, this is in early 2017. Um, Ethereum uh, is, for those who aren't familiar with cryptocurrency at all, it's, it's, it's a more complicated Bitcoin. If Bitcoin wasn't complicated enough for you, it's much more complicated. Um, but Ethereum reached what was then an all-time high for it. And it had, when Ethereum had originally come out, um, it had set a really high price and dropped like a rock. And it looked like Ethereum was dead for a little while. It had some hacks. 
But for some reason, it had recovered. And people were like, oh, this is interesting. This is confusing. What's going to happen? And you know, this is our previous red line, and this is what our traffic looked like. But we had this thing where suddenly we were seeing these crazy spikes. Like People were really interested all of a sudden. And what this translated to in the company was basically chaos, destruction, like this big explosion. Um, we had like an article I can't find anymore in the New York Times. We had like everybody who visited the website basically got this, you know, service unavailable. At one point, we were down for eight hours an entire day, not a single request server. We just couldn't figure out how to make it work. Um, this is a picture of me with like I guess the other people at the time. We were just sitting in a room. We were just like the company literally had like in the office there were like. 50 of us total. The company had 70 people. And we were just like, ah, uh, like I'm, I'm just like, I make, I make infra stuff, uh, you know. But all of us had to do it. We had no choice. We were scaling this website, whether we lived or died. Uh, we drank a lot of this energy drink. I don't think they make it anymore called Runa. It was really good. And all these stupid, um, they have these crazy beverage friz, fridges out there. But the, the point was, um, at all attention, it felt like in the world was on us at this point. Um, there were all, I didn't leave the logo, but like there were all types of these articles. Coinbase suffers another major outage. This is my favorite Reddit post of all time. It says, Coinbase is falling apart at the seams, it seems. <laughs> and you know, they just go on and on. And there's some Reddit comments in here that are just gold, gold. Funny thing is Coinbase supposedly uses AWS, so capacity isn't an issue unless they don't use auto scaling or other features are too cheap to pay for more AWS resources or just straight up lazy. They do this every time the price pumps. If you believe they can't predict an appropriate scale of their service, you're delusional. They do this purposefully. And you know, I'm sitting, we're sitting in the room like, man, like we haven't slept. Like obviously that's not what we're doing, but that was the perception of the world. Like, what a bunch of idiots. They're on the world stage right now, and they can't even keep the website up. And there was a reason, a reason that only made sense to us in that room. It was a ghost. It was clearly a ghost. It was not a problem with the systems. It was a ghost. Um, we actually had this logo drawn. We got t-shirts later. Um, but it was a ghost. And I want to drop back to the basics before I talk about the ghost, because if you want to understand what it takes to scale a system, you kind of have to take a step back. When these services are down, when a website is down, what's going on? Well, to scale something, to prevent something from going down, you need to saturate zero things. Zero. Once you saturate something, unless you have another route, it's, like, rain is a really, it rained really heavy uh, about an hour ago for those who were a part of it. If you watch the way gutters fill and all that, it's almost exactly like that. If you fill a gutter, it starts going out on the roof. It starts going down the sides. It hits your windows. Not good, right? Eventually in your basement, and you get all angry. The, the way these systems work on the back end is exactly the same. You can saturate zero things. And so when you think about that, here's like the most dead simple example. This is the most simple Python code you could write to handle an HTTP request, right? If you just sit there with a load balancing tool or load testing tool and crush it, where does it fall over? Kind of a trick question because it's not multi-threaded. It falls over real fast. But this is the multi-threaded version. It's longer. But where does this fall over? This is multi-threaded. You can crush away at it. Where does this fall over? I'll leave it to you all. Where does it fall over? Anyone want to take a guess? What, what causes it to stop working? Go ahead. Um, possible, yeah. What else? Connection sockets. Connection sockets, pretty going. Yeah, so simple answer is connections, pretty easy to saturate. Good saturate threads, too. Both of those are tunable. Um, but CPU is pretty easy to saturate. And if you've tuned it, you will hit CPU thresholds pretty quickly. Just the same way if you run true on your system, you, you'll, you'll max out your CPU. But it depends, right? You still know. That is the simplest example I can come up with, and there's three different answers, right? But imagine you start to get a little bit bigger. There are a lot of things that can saturate. So it can be CPU, uh, memory, network I.O., network bandwidth, connections, file descriptors, threads. Um, 
disk I.O., disk storage, the list goes on. And that's just for an app server. But we're talking about these complicated systems that span many, many, many different um, like services. So the easiest answer is to go bigger. So you had a server that had one core or one computer. You get one that has, oh, this is AWS, 448 virtual CPUs. This is only 44 grand a month. It's like two engineers, good deal. Or, and you know, all this memory. That's one way to solve problems of scale. You go bigger, bigger pipe, right, in the water analogy. So you go bigger, get a bigger computer, but what's the problem with this? Well, there's one problem, which is if it goes down, everything goes down, so then you gotta have two for high availability. Um, it's still not very highly available. So what people do in the industry, or just generally, is you horizontally scale. So you just, instead of having one server, you have the same size of compute resources and you have 10. This is great because if you lose one, you're not actually, you have to plan for loss in these situations. So you throw money at it, you build a bunch of horizontal servers. So let's do our next pop quiz. Let's say we have unlimited of these regular size, just like the most, like, like the you know, speed of my laptop. So we have unlimited of them, chained up. And there's no de dependencies at all, same server, right? We're running the same thing. And we have a load balancer in front of them that has unlimited scale. What's our bottleneck? Anybody want to take a guess? No. Budget? <laughs> unlimited. I said unlimited two times. Yeah. What was that? Something got taped over, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no bottleneck, right? There's no bottleneck. If you have this scenario, if you have unlimited servers and an unlimited scale load balancer, it doesn't matter. It scales forever, right? It doesn't matter if you have a 400 megahertz Pentium 3 CPU with 5 megabytes of memory, 500 or 56K, right? Like whatever. It doesn't matter. Right, you have unlimited of them. You can just throw them all behind a load balancer that goes to infinity, it doesn't matter. There's no way to saturate. Until you put a load, until you put a database behind it, or you put a shared resource that doesn't scale behind it, right? Now that we're on the same page, uh, a, a lesson. So first of all, design always, when you're thinking about scale, for infinite horizontal scale. You should in your mind be able to imagine a world where the scale goes infinite and a trap being virtual scale. So yeah, if, if every piece can scale horizontally and definitely, your system will scale horizontally and definitely. And any time you choose a form of vertical scale in a system you're designing, you've immediately locked yourself, you, you, you've completely limited yourself in the case of growth. So back to this ghost. So I had a ghost. We had a ghost. And we would, we would sit there for hours and hours. Um, and this is what our system looked like. Right, it, it was, there, there's rail servers, there's a database, there's these, they don't really do anything, our infra tooling is never the problem. So what could it be? We had one tool, it was called New Relic, I don't know if people are familiar with New Relic, but it showed that this red being our database and this red being our app server. So just the two things, it shows them both taking time up in, in our service. So when we would have problems, this is what it looked like. You just big bubble, it's showing that all this time is being taken up. It can't, you can't service requests anymore. You're using too many resources, and it bubbled up. And we stared at this, and we looked at the MongoDB dashboard, and it said CPU is at 43%. We're like, well, that's not saturated. We went down everything on MongoDB, nothing was saturated. We were like, well, th this is no good. It must be a ghost. So we tried everything. And I mean everything. We had some crazy conspiracy theories, like I should go back to the picture, I could tell you all their different dumb conspiracy theories and mine. It's pretty bad. We were like tuning the Linux kernel and all types of silly things. The answer, of course, was that we were taking the wrong approach. The approach you should take is absolutely never, never, never to take random guesses, right? Because what's that gonna get you? You're just gonna take a bunch of stupid swings and end up tuning the Linux kernel when that was obviously not the issue. So we, we just took a lot of guesses. So this is our traffic going up, and this is all this stupid stuff we did. We'd, we'd upgrade things randomly, we'd split the clusters and hope that you know, splitting them apart would lower the traffic on the databases. And what ended up being the case is that it did it help, but we, were, we still had a ghost. And I dreamed about this ghost. I, 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 every night I worried about this ghost. 
And what ended up solving it for us was, and, and it, it, this isn't the only thing, but the main thing is we got really down and dirty and we threw out all the third party monitoring options and we went straight into our database um, like driver, monkey patched it in Ruby, and we added a simple log. Every single DB query that took longer than five milliseconds, we logged out as much information as we could. So the database, what collection, you know, response size, request size, query time, whatever we could find. And we threw this all into a big, fat Elasticsearch cluster. And that was how we were able to find things like this. So the other cool thing I forgot to show you is that we had Mongo source in there. So we had the exact line of code where the query came from. So what we were able to do is methodically find things like this. So this is uh, on our device class in Rails. We were able to find request that was 16, this is response, I'm assuming it's bytes. There were 16 megabytes on the response sizes from Mongo. You can see nothing else is even in the same ballpark. This is our average response size. It was clogging our pipes. We couldn't see this in the dashboard because they didn't have this on the dashboard because we used some really junky service. It's not the point. But we, now, then we found it. We fixed that problem. And then we could just go down the list, go down the list. Brings us to our next lesson, which is good instrument, instrumentation is the first step, right? That'll solve your problems. But bad instrumentation, like we were using with that other chart I showed, will just straight up obscure them. It'll drive you down the wrong directions and it'll waste a bunch of time. But the summer ended. And, uh, oh, damn it, number one on the App Store. That's something you don't want to, uh, you, you certainly, now I'm like, well, that was cool, but back then we were, we were dreading it. But we had all summer, actually, I, I'm, I'm missing this in the chart, but you'll see it here. We actually had this summer here, where this, this was actually our previous peak, where we were having all the exploding people. And we had this whole summer where actually the prices cooled off before things got crazy around Thanksgiving. And all summer long, we worked. And what did we do? We did a few things. So how do we survive? First of all, um, there's this concept of like request multiplication, I guess you'd call it. So if when people open the app, the app immediately goes out. So you just imagine opening any app, like the, the Uber app or whatever. You open it, it immediately needs to fetch all types of information, right? It needs to know oh, where are the drivers on the road, what's the traffic look like on Google Maps, that type of thing. Um, each of those requests goes to the app servers, and each of them has to make a bunch of DB queries. This piles up. If your main constraint is a DB query, you can see how all we'd have to do is kill two of those requests, and we cut our DB queries in half. Or alternatively, we could, on each request, cut the DB queries in half, and similarly, we cut our DB queries in half. What it turns out is you basically want to do both. So it means that for a company, it needs to be basically full court press to solve scaling issues. Because your mobile app developers, I'm sure there are some of you in here, can't hide under a rock with scaling issues, right? It, it, it's, it's literally, you're the front lines of defense when you're scaling something. Every request you make from a mobile app can lead to all of these different resource constraints that can slow down an app. Um, this is actually a screenshot I took of, this is one, we, we used to put a, uh, a tag on every request, the request ID. And you can see this is one single API request. And it made, whatever, what's, what's the number? 16 different database queries, right? So these people are basically, or no, I think this might be the other way around. These are all the API requests that were made by this one user in an amount of time that is less than, uh, a couple seconds. So they just basically just showing the app making like literally duplicate requests in like milliseconds, just making eight different requests to this accounts page. It kind of just demonstrates it. But we did a lot of things like we sat down and we had boring meetings. And we'd sit down and be like, okay, each week, where are we at with uptime? Where are we at with these latencies? Where are like how many 500s do we have? And just like kind of keep track. Look at where the system's at. Yeah, help. And finally, we made some really awesome dashboards. So this is kind of like on the visualization theme, but this is an example of a dashboard. Actually, this is my favorite dashboard. It's got a lot of lines and no one understood it, but I could read it. It's like the matrix. And you can see there's all these lines here that show the prices of the cryptocurrencies up here. And when they drop, the traffic goes up. Green line is buys and sells on the platform. And then the red lines down here are 
our little outages we'd have. So you can see, not a good time. But you know, we handled traffic, and buys and sells stayed relatively flat, which is what we were looking for. That said, we still went down a lot throughout that period, but by not, not as much, and we survived, I guess. Um, so the lesson is uh, that good instrumentation will surface problems as well. Not just surface problems, but it'll surface problems before they happen. So good instrumentation will show you when things are on the edge, when things are approaching saturation. The same way if you kind of watch like water levels, you quickly realize where it's getting higher than what you want. You put in some more drains. Oh, another lesson of mine is that MongoDB gets a lot of flack. Michael at least gets the reference. Did, do you? No? Does anybody get this reference? Am I old? Yeah. What? It's sharding internet Web scale. Web MongoDB scale. is, oh man. When did I get, yeah. So it, MongoDB is, MongoDB was a huge joke as a database for a very, very long time. Very huge joke. And I don't know. I think generally people get obsessed with the tech or the tool they're using, but in my experience mostly, unless it's a true dud, most tools will scale where you need them to go. Um, and it's probably not a good idea to blame the tool, but more to blame the carpenter, of course. We are the carpenters. So, I, uh, I personally got a little bored uh, around this time. So this is after, after that big spike here. This is what ended up happening right after I quit. It's a bad timing. But I got bored right here. And, you know, we, we had to go back to creating awesome infra tooling, and it wasn't as much scaling once we got to here because people forgot about Bitcoin for a really long time, and I left. But not before I didn't get my face. Let's see if this will work. I got my face on the Coinbase recruiting video, which is one of my great accomplishments. It's not no audio. There I am. They, <laughs> <laughs> they're like. Look at the computer and look at the, the, the trading platform. I'm like, I don't even use this. But they're like, use it. They're like, we're going to get a video through your glasses. It's going to be so cool. I'm like, all right. <laughs> but anyway, I got bored and interviewed a bunch of places. And let's see if I can get this back to work in here. Nope, that's not what I want. Just go for me. Uh, no. There we go. I got bored and I went to a company called DoorDash. I interviewed a bunch of places and at that time I thought I was hot stuff and I joined around this green line. At that time it was not clear that these whole services were going to work out. Uh, at that point I was like why would DoorDash win? Uber Eats is clearly better. Um, apparently that's not the case but when I joined I ran into the biggest mess. This is a company that's scaling, of course. The biggest mess I've ever seen in my life. They had a service for every single thing you could think of. The customer support, basically microservices gone wrong. Order tracking service, coupon service, and it goes on and on and on. And of course, I didn't leave without creating my own service, of course, the incident service. I added to the collection, um, as you do. But DoorDash is a particularly crazy place. So you think about um, most markets are just two-sided markets. Like, I mean, Uber obviously is a good example. There's drivers and there's riders. Or you take an example like, um, like even Amazon. It's a two-sided marketplace, really. It's like you and the merchant, right? And Amazon's like a, either they're the merchant or they're you know, an intermediary. But DoorDash is crazy because you have all these different people working here. And when we go down, basically, customers get pissed because they can't order or their food doesn't arrive. Merchants get upset because orders just sit there. First of all, they're not getting orders, and their orders just sit there getting cold. Drivers don't know where to deliver. Or by the time the app comes back on, food is cold. So it just causes real world chaos when you go down. And by the way, we went down every single day for three, the entire three months I worked there. Uh, on Friday at 4 p.m., so every single day. So you just didn't want to use that app around that time. Sometimes it went back fast, but needless to say, I took away only one major lesson from DoorDash, which was fewer pieces is better. When it comes to scaling, 
combining and making all of those different services work is the stuff of nightmares. Try, the order service, like I, I already kind of explained with, if you have a single service behind one load balancer, it can scale forever. You add another service, now you have to scale two services. And some people might say, well, this third service is a little slow, let's add a third service, but of course, as you know, you just created another problem, something else to scale. All these things, when you look at cloud providers, they do all scale automatically, right? But, of course, even though they scale automatically, that automatic scaling isn't actually as comprehensive as you think. Application servers take a lot of effort to scale properly, and there's a million things that can go wrong. It's not, I, I could do a whole talk on that. But another thing is, yeah, th this is the big thing I took away that I, I will carry with me the rest of my life. Anytime you add any piece to any system, you have to make sure it's scalable on every single dimension or optional. So for example, we had a service called the promo service at DoorDash. And that service, if it didn't work, you couldn't get your promotions, like your coupon codes or whatever. But that service would break and it would take the entire app down. So not only could you not order, but you couldn't check the status of your order, the drivers couldn't check what was going on, right? Terrible design. But there are concepts like circuit breakers and, or timeouts that would allow if the promo service doesn't work for everything to continue on. And that's a lot of what you know, good design is and that's a lot of what I did there. But the point is that I also got, oh yeah, and <laughs> the, the next lesson is the place that pays the most, which by the way, DoorDash gave me the highest offer by like a penny and I took it because of that penny. And the, the major lesson, this is a, a less technical lesson, is the place that pays you most is probably pretty desperate and uh, you'll find out why soon enough. So I did. Um, but I'm, I'm easily tempted. Uh, I, I love greener pastures. So my, my old friend from Coinbase hit me up and said, hey, do you want some contract work on the side for three weeks? Well, you know, we need some help, blah, blah, blah. I thought I'd check with you first. And uh, LinkedIn is very, very generous when it comes to these numbers. On my LinkedIn, it says I've been there for, I was there for six months, but the reality is more like three months. I kind of tuned out like as soon as I got there and they're really generous. I, I left DoorDash really fast. It's not even worth it. I put it in the title, but I had to give it a lip service. But the next place I went was um, to, with my friend's company, Clubhouse. Clubhouse um, was, during the pandemic, a really popular like social audio app that a lot of people used. Um, like, it's just like a, a weird pandemic era way to interact with people because you couldn't get out of the house. It was a way to just find random people and interact with them. And it was very popular for a time. Um, but when I joined October 10th, it was really just small potatoes, really nothing. You know, like no people on it, it was invite oriented. But this is where I really came to learn and appreciate, um, oh sorry, I can just move to. This is where I truly came to appreciate exponential growth. So this is, this is a good example of exponential growth here. It's pretty damn near actually exponential growth. And they reached out to me on October 10th. I probably started working by October 19th, or maybe faster. By December 2nd, we migrated away from Heroku into AWS. And on December 10th, we'd migrated into AWS. And then things just went absolutely nuts. I put this red line here for reference when I show you the next chart. Um, but this is, this is kind of us going into December. Um, for those who are interested at all in the Heroku to AWS migration, um, I, at the time, was really bought into AWS. I think they're a really amazing, um, amazing service, really cool managed infrastructure. But I tried to find analogies to things like Dynos and Heroku, and ECS, Fargate ECS on AWS seemed like a magical solution. Heroku Postgres has, or AWS has a thing called Postgres Aurora. Any crunchy data people showed up today? No? Good. Whew. Um, but the, the, the Postgres alternative in AWS is Aurora. So we tried. I'd had all my learnings. I'd been through the ringer a couple times. I designed it perfectly for like 30x scale or something like that, um, almost. Um, but then we, we, it just really blew up. And it was, you know, for a minute there, it looked like th this was the thing, you know. Um, a lot of these stories, everybody tried. It just looked like Clubhouse's center of the world. And all these stories got people signing up. 
I don't know how many of you used it. I, I mean, a lot of, lot of I mean, I, I, don't, I have no concept how popular it was because I worked there. But the, the architecture itself was pretty simple, just on paper, right? We had Cloudflare again, a load balancer, and a server. And we had a database, like a Postgres database. This is really the gist of it. Um, we also had these background queues that weren't as important, and we used Redis for caches. But of those two major core things, the database and the Django app server, both of them crumbled fundamentally under this scale. The first one was uh, ECS Fargate. So Fargate, if anybody's never heard of it, it's basically supposed to be Amazon's solution to just magic VMs. You give it a Docker image and a couple parameters and it spins you up an app server. Uh, it's pretty cool, but the problem was we got a little big. This is a screenshot I had, but we would, we'd frequent, down here you can see it says like 700 app servers. We were frequently in like the 1500 range of app servers. And when you deploy with Fargate, you have to blue-green deploy. Blue-green deploy means you literally double your apps, you spin up all fresh ones with the new version of your code, you have double the apps. And what we ran into, you can't really read it up there, I'll make it bigger. We literally ran into a failure condition with load balancers, like Amazon's core product, Elastic Load Balancers. They couldn't handle a blue-green flip-over with that many hosts at the same time. So we literally couldn't deploy for three days straight until it would get to the middle of the night, we'd deploy, wait. Um, and this is like a core, we, we, I set it at AW, on the phone with AWS and yell at them. Like, what do you mean the ELB can't, can't flip over? Like, what do you mean? ELBs scale forever. Turns out not. Turns out ELBs don't scale forever. Turns out ELBs and everything in AWS, just like everything else everywhere, they, they work most of the time. And Tell you how we fix that in a second. But the other thing we ran into is we use this thing called AWS Aurora Postgres, and it's a really magical tool. You basically have a, a writer DB. Um, so all your writes have to go through one DB, but you could theoretically have as many scaling readers as you want, as long as it's not more than 15. Um, this, is a, <laughs> this is a dramatic reenactment of what it looked like, is we used all 15 readers really, really fast. So within, by the time we were in January, February, we were completely out of readers, completely. We were completely so our only option, right, we couldn't scale the database anymore. It, that was it. Your only option was to do things like I was talking about before. You can either reduce the number of reads to the database from your application server, or you can reduce the number of queries coming from uh, the client apps to the backend servers. So yeah, sometimes less is, sometimes you just scale faster than some AWS services. Uh, can handle. But, so my original architecture, um, junk, um, we, we literally, the app and the DB were both completely limited, functionally, like, just like at a core level by this, you know, user enthusiasm. So like, yeah, I guess Aurora Postgres, I should have known. Like, I should have known there's only 15 readers, like, well, you could hit that. Of course, in my mind, I'm like, we'll never hit 15 readers. But Fargate was a real wake-up call that really, like, even though it's AWS, you think, oh, AWS, like, everything they have will scale forever. It's not true. Um, Fargate, it's not just the ELB issue. Like, Fargate couldn't spin up for us a 1,000 Fargate servers in less than an hour. So deploys would take an hour because they had to steal capacity from everywhere. They just didn't have it sized to be able to handle this. They have the systems to do this, but they don't have them, like, it's just, there's, there's actually rifts within these companies, and you can just bet wrong. You can pick the wrong service. Um, so yeah, this is the red line I showed you before. That was around December where we ended, and it, it just kept going. And this is the line that I think is the most interesting one, this one over here. So me and Mo, so the guy who brought me in and me, that was it till here, right? And you can't see, but this is the top. This was the top, February 22. It just started going down from there. We hired our next backend engineer in the beginning of February. So, you know, like, and, and, and not, like, of course, hiring these people would have been great if things kept going up. It didn't. Otherwise, I would be in, I would, you know, I don't know where I'd be. I'd probably be on a boat somewhere. I don't know. But, like, it didn't. <laughs> it went back down. And I uh, should have stayed at DoorDash. But sometimes reinforcements don't arrive, right? Like, sometimes, legitimately, 
you, you, you just, like this was, this was a time where, that was interesting, right? That was when Thailand got on the platform. And by the time you bring people on, right, the third backend engineer, like it might be too late, right? And who knows how our outages impacted our ability to keep growing, right? Because we spent all of our company resources, we couldn't add new features, we couldn't grow in any way. All we could do was just try to stay up. So our app did not add features from basically November to March, all the way out here. We didn't add features. All we did was keep the app up. Um, so back to Postgres and some other backend services. Um, when you think about these services, when you think about these backends, one of the classic traps when you're horizontally scaling, and I'll cover this quickly because it's kind of an advanced topic, but this is one of the biggest things you ran into at Clubhouse is that you'd have so many app servers that you would overwhelm the backend services because of just connection pressure. Connections can be expensive in Postgres. You can have things like DNS, um, like Redis has re uh, connection limitations, 65,000. Um, LaunchShark is a feature flag framework in Memcache. They all have connection thresholds set. 65,000 tends to be the one. Um, and the AWS's DNS service will very quickly be overwhelmed within your AWS region. They only give you so much capacity. Um, so you have to do this thing with poolers. Uh, poolers basically gather connections up and multiplex them down to the servers. So that's an easy way to handle this. I mean, you can only do so much for Postgres, which was an unhappy panda. But it helps with other ones. But eventually, if you just get enough app servers, you really need an even beefier layer down here, or you need to adapt the actual app server side. Oh, and by the way, when you have this many app servers, if you're blue-green deploying, literally that many is double when you deploy. Yeah. So the lesson is to vertically scale your horizontal scale to protect your vertical scale. And by that, you make these apps really big. You make your app servers crazy big. So you take the normal apps that we had, those little tiny ones, and you just pick the biggest instance type that Amazon has that's like a reasonable value, and you just use those. So you're literally vertical scaling because horizontal scale has run out for you. And then, and this actually, I call it the final scalable state. I think this could have gone legitimately 50 to 100x from where our peak was by the time we were there because uh, we, we threw Postgres in the trash, and all these pullers and caches are pretty powerful at, at preventing connection pressure on any of these, and all of these scale horizontally forever. Um, yeah, that stupid elephant. What happened to that? Well, we switched to a cool tool called DynamoDB, which is basically a database that's designed at its very core to scale across horizontally. Complicated topic. It's worth the whole talk. But that's what we ended up doing with Postgres. We kicked it out. And the final result of our architecture by the time we were done was that all the green arrows are things that could scale, in my mind, basically forever. Our app server with those big instances could pretty much scale forever. Cloudflare, unlimited. Um, our SQS queues for our queues, our, our background queue services, uh, DynamoDB, they could scale forever. We were slightly limited on Redis. And I put a, a yellow because Apparently, there are ways to work with Amazon, but you're limited to, I think, 256 nodes when you scale horizontally. Um, we were getting, we were only like 100, so I don't think that would have been a big deal. But Postgres would have permanently been an issue, I think. Um, but we had moved by the time I left, um, or by the time we stopped focusing on scaling, um, we had migrated about 80% of all of our tables to DynamoDB and probably would have continued doing that if the time came. So it would have just boiled down to a Redis problem. And I don't know what we would have done from there, but it probably would have been fine. Whew. So in conclusion, here's a couple just random thoughts. They're not related to the lessons. So I always recommend just, it's, it's, it feels like a no-brainer to me. Take the bigger career risk. It's more fun. Um, they don't always pay off, and I've literally seen two not pay off, and my three, 
four, I don't know, but like, they're always more fun and they always advance your career in much more interesting ways. It makes your life more interesting, everything more interesting. Um, and then live authentically is my idea, because I think about the fact that I bought that weed on the internet. Like, I don't know, I probably would have ended up getting a job somewhere like that anywhere, but it was like this silly thing I did, not being scared about the consequences that was kind of in line with my values, and not my values, I don't know, but it ended up being fine. And like, it's not worth running around scared about like jail or whatever, you know? Uh, <laughs> Um, if you're in doubt, instrument. Like it really, like, and this applies to everything, not just computers, everything. Like, you can instrument anything. I dare you to find something I can't instrument. And if you do that first, you're, you're just gonna be in a better position. Because once you have the data, it's really easy to make decisions. Obviously, as opposed to just taking guesses, using your own intuition which probably ends up being wrong more than you want to admit. And finally, I talked a lot about scaling in this talk. Uh, I was at companies like, when I left DoorDash, or when I left Clubhouse, or Coinbase to go to DoorDash, I was looking for my next fix. It's very, very exciting. It's very enthralling to be in the middle of this stuff. I've definitely chased down companies that kind of provide these like scaling opportunities. But for the most part, you don't need to worry about scale. Most companies don't need to worry about scale. So don't prematurely scale. Like focus on product market fit, like obviously. But like I'd say prematurely think about scale. You know, just like keep it in the back of your mind. Like where am I designing a system with a single server in the way that I actually don't have a plan for how I'll make that two or 10? Um, it, it can go a long way, especially if you do happen to accidentally get a bunch of people. But yeah, thank you all for making it through. That's the end. I'm happy to stick around for questions or whatever. Whatever you want to know. Thanks, Jim. Feared. At Coinbase, I thought we might go to jail a couple times. Not for anything I did, trust me. That was innocent. I was, I was living in California, I don't care about weed there. The, we, we had listed something, a new cryptocurrency, and basically throughout the, the I, mean, I didn't actually think we were going to jail, but it was very scary. We listed a new cryptocurrency, Bitcoin Cash, and like we just didn't have the controls in place. And like things were leaking out our APIs. We had to talk to a bunch of lawyers. It was, it was not fun. The thing I loathed the most was Clubhouse. I did that at the same time as I had my second kid was born. And I just, I realized then like it consumes so much of my time. Like I, even though I like it, it turned into like, I just couldn't eat dinner with my family a lot of times. That's when I realized I'd take a step back. Good question, Joel. Anything else? All right, go ahead. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Hopefully it's my own company. Hopefully I create my own scaling needs. Yeah, go ahead. It seems like a lot of the problems that get murdered, uh, at least not DoorDash, but for game-based solutions. Yes, always. Do you, I assume that DoorDash or other interface can reach those for new purposes, correct? Oh, yeah, they can only wish, yeah. They, <laughs> Yeah, but then you have to scale more instances. Like, you, cause like, okay, so the process of scaling is like, you have to tune all these little special snowflake databases versus at Clubhouse we standardized on one database. You had one to worry about. And you just kept an eye on that one. As long as that one was good, you were fine. Um, at DoorDash and um, Coinbase, everything was designed around having basically that. Like, oh, a bunch of databases, that way they can't overwhelm each other. It is a better system. You're only supposed to have one database per service. That doesn't always pan out, but um, the problem is it's the one, and, and these organizations get super siloed. So the promotion service team manages their own database and their own service. 
So who's their database expert? They don't have one, they're just praying. And then you get your, like literally every week, the traffic is going up. Even if it's only going up by 1%, let's say you just went below the levels of scale last week, one service broke, everybody rushes over, you fix that one that broke. Ah, oh, darn market service, ah, oh, they always suck, you know? Everybody goes over and you fix that. Then the next week, traffic goes up again. Guess what, market service doesn't break anymore. You just gave it a bunch of love and attention. It's not gonna break for five weeks. But the next one breaks down the road and you just literally, it's a game of spinning the plates. And like, all it takes is for one or two things to break to take the whole site down, unless you have good circuit breaking or timeouts in place. It's a whole other topic, but basically, the answer is there's no correct way to do anything other than to be way on top of things with monitoring. All your databases, everything needs to be tight. That's why when you go down the microservice path, everything needs to be standardized. Everything needs to have the same dashboard showing the same information, and you need to know exactly what you're doing to like, be able to track down what's gonna break next. Like Google has like literally you know, probably hundreds of microservices, but Google has a whole team that they built called Site Reliability Engineers. They onboard with teams, they have a whole framework. Everybody knows exactly what would break next in Google if traffic were to go higher because they've standardized on that. Companies like DoorDash are flying by the seat of their pants because they didn't think anybody would ever use it because they didn't know there'd be a pandemic, you know? And then they just get, the wave washes over them. But yeah. Cool. Yes. I mean, if there are outages, it, I think, eh, I'm not a mobile app developer, and I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but sometimes they just are like, stupid back end. You know, there's this little bit of like, oh, well, the back end is having trouble. You, all you mobile developers know what I'm talking about. The back end's the problem. And it's true most of the time, I admit, but there are some situations where it is worth sitting down there at the sim and looking at like what requests are coming down the line. Like what, how many requests are you actually sending? Nowadays, a lot of modern frameworks do a better job of preventing those requests coming through. But still, if, you, if, you, if you're loading like weird views in, I don't, I don't, I'm not a mobile developer, I'm making up words, I feel like, but it, it can cause those extra requests and it can double down on the load on backend. So yeah, yeah, just, yeah, go ahead, Ty. Yes. Watch the what? Oh yeah, it, oh, watching the recording, yeah. I think the big thing too is right, like, the mobile app can make a bunch of requests down, but like I showed, like the back end then can make too many requests to the database as well. It's real easy, especially in modern programming languages that give you all this flexibility to not know where you're making database queries. Like you're using like an ORM and you're just kind of like, you just want to know the first record, you know, on, on that or whatever, and you're just making a bunch of queries accidentally, but then it goes down the chain even further. Like if you're a back end talking to another back end, and you're, because that's how it works in microservices worlds, it's just sometimes you do a whole loop, you talking to another backend, you make two requests that backend one, it could have been one, same issue. Also, it comes down to API design. That's why people like GraphQL and so on, is like, if you have a good, well-designed API, you might only need one request. Poorly designed API, you might be making a slightly different, two slightly different requests down to the backend or the database that maybe could have sufficed with just one if you just, you, know, you were getting that same information from the DB anyway, so. Lots of fun stuff to think about. From a time investment standpoint, would you say, because I'm not a developer, um, it would take more time and resources to do something that will scale out horizontally at low versus that, like, I'm assuming all of those aspects are part of it. I guess it's easier, quicker, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it just, it, you, you can't in the modern world design apps at scale vertically because, you, like, you just, like, there, there, there are what are called cattle and pets in the modern world. It's probably very insensitive to, to use this, but like cattle, cattle and pets, when you talk about servers. Pets are something you keep around, you have one of, it, maybe it's sitting in your server closet and it, it does something very small that'll never be that big of a deal. That doesn't need to horizontally scale. 
But anything a customer touches in their day to day, that's cattle. That should never exist beyond 30 days, for example. That, that should never exist, be, definitely beyond like six months. Um, and that would be a, a, a cattle. You're supposed to knock off the cattle and just get new ones, right? Like, it's, as I said, insensitive, but like that's what the term you use. And the, the whole point is that by designing services horizontally, you actually gain a lot of benefits. Um, you don't end up with these special snowflakes pets that you, you have to worry about whether they go up or down. So it's just better practice all around. It's like an anti-pattern to have a vertically scaled service. Yeah. Yeah. They're not going to help you back, yeah. Well, it's, it's very, it is the easiest thing. You're following a tutorial online, you load up a Linux server, you follow the steps, it works. You do that at home with your NAS or something, and you, you, know, you, you get it working, you're like, cool, I got it working. You're like really excited, and you, you just don't want to touch it again. That's what people want to do with servers, but that's, that's just the worst practice, because then what happens if it breaks? Well, you have to pray. You have to throw in the error messages to Google or ChatGPT and pray that you can fix it. But if you design that service with a clear-cut script that spins it up, and you can do that as much as you want, you never have to worry about fixing it. You just launch a new one. And I think that that's kind of the whole vertical versus horizontal scaling conversation. So it's a whole, it, it could be a whole talk, basically, like the best practices of horizontal scaling. Sure, yeah. Right, fair enough. Yeah, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, like it, sometimes you just got to get the job done. You know, like it, you you have to weigh it in. Like if maintenance, one of the best ways to think about it is if you know, has anyone heard the concept of toil? Toil is a concept in like SRE circles um, where it's like, how much time are you spending fixing broken stuff? And so if that number, that number is fine at like 10, 20% of your time. But when that number gets higher, you actually are sapping away so much of resources that you're not able to make forward motion anymore. You've made too many hacks in the past that you're preventing forward motion. And I think that's what you want to monitor basically, is like how often are we going back and fixing stuff? And if that number gets high, you need to like go and fix things permanently. Like in SRE circles, you'd have what's called a code red. So if things are broken too much, you're not allowed to ship new features until you fix old stuff. And usually that's sent from like a top level. And we would do code reds at all these companies. Um, so like your service is broken. Um, we're, we're like, we're escalating and like you're, you're now under code red. You have to like, you have to do these five things according to our matrix that we made. We didn't have chat GPT back then, but that would have made it really easy. And you have to, you have to like, Re, you have to like add this monitoring and this and that, and then you can you can add new features. But like, all developers need to be focused on that for now. Anyway, yeah, fun stuff. Go ahead, Nate. Oh yeah, every one of these companies toyed with GraphQL. I mean, Coinbase did. We were using Apollo for a little bit, and so did. Um, so did DoorDash. Uh, GraphQL, in my opinion, is it's it's good for mobile developers, but I really don't think it's good for backend because at the end of the day, all it's doing is it's it's going to another service that's at your front layer. Like, if you pull up like one of these random architectures, you're basically adding a new layer here. That's your GraphQL service, and it still needs to make all those requests to the different backends. The problem is then you're you're abstracting it at the top, and then. What will happen is GraphQL will do, it'll make more requests than are necessary. And it means that mobile developers or any app developers out here don't have to think as more about the requests they're making. And what it ends up being is really, really convenient and I think really good for big companies who are building big, like a big company like Amazon or Google is going to have a big fat layer here, a big fat layer here between like the data, like in front of the app server is going to have a big fat layer in front of the DBs. It's going to do all types of crazy monitoring. But most of these smaller companies like DoorDash, Coinbase, super small companies in the scheme of things, you know, like 200 developers or less, they don't have the resources to build like well-monitored systems. 
So the only way to operate is simple, 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 until you get to the point where you've made enough money that you can like actually hire specialized teams to go in and build these things properly. Otherwise, like with DoorDash, Apollo was always a huge pain because it would, it would break, it's not a very good service. Like a lot of GraphQL stuff is actually not as like cut and dry. Like there's not like, you don't download GraphQL and put it on there yet. <laughs> Have you used GraphQL? Uh, no, not too much. Yeah. It's, it's just not a very good middle layer service. It's, anyway, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. And I thought about GraphQL when I was like, we, we, all mobile developers want GraphQL. It sounds great. It's like clean APIs. You don't have to build as big, complicated client libraries. I mean, they're all getting better. That was back 2017, so you got like a good seven years since then. I would say, I still think New Relic is a great plug and play. Datadog APM is pretty solid. Data, if you're small, Datadog is not that expensive and it's the best. Like it's just clean cut, simple. Every company I've ever been at, we have had to add custom monitoring to certain locations. Now, are you adding custom monitoring? So for those who aren't, familiar with like different monitoring products, you can either send out logs, which are like, like a log, like just a text file that you can index, or you're sending out like basically aggregated metrics, stats D is the term, and like you can basically aggregate, it's like getting a count of how many times things happen. Um, when I talk about custom, all I'm doing, you're just talking about adding new instrumentation to the app, I would say you should always be doing that. Like if there is something you're curious about, you should always be adding like that, that quick line, of, it's always just a line of code. Whether they're using like the, but like Datadog and Datadog has logs platforming. Elasticsearch is good too. I would just use, I would just, I wouldn't even think I'd use Datadog unless it's a budgetary issue. There's nothing else close. Yeah. Cool. Last call. Good to go. All right. Thanks, everybody.